Kelly's in Minneapolis and Chris is in Nevada. Okay, uh, let's uh, all if be seated and we'll have turned to page 275. Have a nice crowd here this morning with so many people on vacation. But, and uh, turn to 275, it's Blessed Redeemer. And I guess we're going to sing all verses. <coughs> keep sitting in the back, I'll move the pulpit down in the aisle. <laughs> move those pews up front. Oh, good morning to see everybody here. I know we have a lot of people traveling today and for the week, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a good day to be here for sure, and I know uh, the gospel's being spread all over. So before we open with prayer, I have uh, added a few things to the list here. We had Wallace, Wallace Broadham, my mom's brother, who was, uh, he's going through some medical issues, so we'll add him to the list. Is there any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, Angela. If you haven't heard, Carly's test, we prayed for last week, but Carly's test all came back, and they all came back, uh, I guess, negative, which would be a good thing, and uh, just a true blessing, and and uh, just thank God for prayers, answered prayers for sure. So we'll definitely want to give praise and thanks for that. Is there any other prayer requests? Okay, yes. Christine.
Thanks, Christine. Okay, if there's no other prayer requests, we'll open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, yeah, we sing the song, you know, Blessed Redeemer, Precious Redeemer, and you definitely are our Blessed Redeemer, Precious Redeemer. Because for without you, Father, without the Son, and without the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, we're all hell doomed sinners. Our Redeemer, he went to the cross and he paid the ransom that we owed. He played the blood payment. He died for each and every one of us for our past and present and future sins. And then he was buried, showing us that he died. And then he resurrected, showing us that he conquered the grave. He, he paid that death payment in full. And he resurrected to show us the payment for sin has been paid in full. And he sits at the right hand of God today. And all we have to do is believe. And, oh, precious Redeemer that you are, you've given us this gift, the gift of eternal life. When we believe, we are ordained on eternal life. And you know what? It's because of your blood that we, be, we are worthy of salvation. And so we're so thankful for that, Father, this precious gift that you've given us in Christ. And Father, as we gather here today, we pray for, we pray for the churches around the world to, to preach the gospel, that the word would be spread, because you know what, our life here is but a mere vapor. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. So Father, we just pray that you'd be with the, the churches that are saved and that are members of the body of Christ. We just ask that they would be bold and speak with authority this morning. And we pray that you'd be with the churches of the Philippines that we're part of there. And, that uh, we just pray you would start softening the hearts there, the people that would, when we travel over there, that uh, they would hear the word of God and receive Christ, Father. And we just pray for the people of Kenya, the, the Bible tracts that we send. We just hopefully they're well received and pray that the people would accept Christ. We know it is a part of their ministry now, and, and we're just so thankful that we could be part of the ministry worldwide. And Father, we pray for people's salvation here and also in America. And, and, uh, but it seems like that when things are good, people don't need Christ. And we just pray that you'd work in people's lives and that they would ultimately see they need a Savior, they need a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and they would put their trust in him. So we have a list here, Father, that we just pray that you'd be with the people here, that you'd soften their hearts, that they would you know, ultimately clean their ears and pull the scales out of their eyes, that they would ultimately see they have a Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. And, Father, we pray for people of medical. We just... Uh, Pray for my mom's brother, Wallace. Just pray that you'd be with him and that you'd give him some peace, their father, give him some healing. He's obviously had a tough road the last 10 years. And even I know I've had the opportunity to share the gospel with him, Father, and we're so thankful for that. But Father, we just pray that you'd be with him and give him some peace and comfort during this tough time. Pray, pray for Carla Foy, who's doing some, struggling with some medical issues. We just pray that you'd comfort her, Father, and give her strength to battle. Belva Lund, who has stage four, a friend of the Foy family, just pray that you'd give her, we know she's saved, but we just pray that you'd give her uh, comfort during this, these last times here on earth, dear Father, and that you'd just give her some peace and give her assurance to her family that Belva's going to be just fine. We pray for Braden Stocky, who received uh, some um, a medical condition this week, Father, who's, uh, who's definitely going to be okay. We know he has surgery here in a couple weeks, Father. We just pray that you'd be with Braden and and ultimately, as a young man, he's probably wanting to get up and ambitious. But, Father, we just ask that you'd keep him, keep him humble, keep him seated, and let him to be healed and be prepared for the surgery. And we just pray that the surgery would go well, Father. We pray for Pastor Tom and Barb. and just so thankful things are going well in their life. And we know some of the medical stuff going on. And, and ultimately, the answered prayer with Pastor Tom going to St. Luke's and there and finding the condition and fixing it right away. So, Father, we're so thankful to have Pastor Tom and Barb here, part of the church, and we just ask that you'd be with them and continue to comfort them and give them strength, Father. We pray for Jane, uh, Christine Maddie's uh, mom. We just pray that you'd be with her, Father. We know she's in remission there. She was in remission, but it seems like cancer had picked up, peaked his old ugly head again, Father. We just pray that she'd be back in remission and remove that cancer from her. And we pray for Erin, you know, Christine's sister. We know that she's miscarriaging at this time and we're so thankful for the grace of God that we know all babies life starts at conception and all babies go to heaven father but father we just pray for salvation for Aaron that through this time that she could see the grace of God that how wonderful it is that all children but if she wants to go to heaven and be with her daughter or son we just pray father that she would accept Christ she would receive Christ and we know you people go through some of these tough times and they hit bottom and ultimately that's when they see the grace of God and then they see the face of Christ and they put their tr trust and faith in him during these tough times and I know uh, from experience by losing a sister myself it is a tough time but 
ultimately you see the grace of God through some of, some of these tough acts in our life, Father. All right, we pray for Guzi, a young man who's transitioning, looking for work, and we just pray that you'd be with him. He came here last Sunday, and we're just so thankful to have him out, and we just pray that things go well with him in West Virginia, Father. And we pray for the people traveling to, to, to out west. Uh, we just pray that you'd open doors for Dennis in the ministry out in Arizona, that you'd bring many people out to hear the gospel. And we pray for safe travels for Ron and Christy, Dennis and Patty, Pat and Christy Kane, and and we're so thankful for Carly, the answered prayer with Carly. She's here today, and family and mom and dad relieved, and that we can find confidence in the Word of God, Father. And we're so thankful when you do hear our prayers and answer our prayers, especially for our kids. And we'll end with that. We just, Father, we just pray that uh, you'd build a hedge of protection around our kids, our sons, and our daughters, and that you'd ultimately raise them on the foundation of Christ and bring them up and keep them strong in the world, Father. And Father, we just ask that they would live by faith and not by sight and not get caught up into the external things of this world, but live for the eternal things of, this, of things to come. So Father, we just ask that you'd bless the message this morning and bless the singing this morning to our body. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to thank all you who prayed for Barb and myself. Barb really had a lot of pain for about two weeks. She, a couple of times she had tears in her eyes. It hurt so bad. And uh, finally they gave her a shot in her knee and took care of the pain pretty much. I don't know how she lucked out either because when I have shots in my legs, they use a needle about that long. And she said it was just a tiny little needle. I said, the Lord must have done that because they sure didn't favor me with a little needle. <laughs> but let's see where we at, Joe Barbie. Before we start, I just, I'm, I'm very emotional today. Um, I have much to say, but um, today's not the day. But I just want to thank everybody for prayers here and at home. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Page 101, Haven of Rest. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 101. <coughs> How many are we going to sing on? All. All of them? Okay. All three. <laughs> Yeah. 
any birthdays this week. Nobody got any older, huh? I have. <laughs> uh, do you have any anniversaries? Are you? Myron? Yeah. Oh, happy anniversary. How many years you been married? Twenty? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't believe that. Oh, happy. We can sing happy anniversary next week. Okay. Okay. We'll get you next week. We'll get you next week. Yeah. No birthdays, though, huh? Who you got back there? Linda? Linda's 45 this week. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to Linda. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Lindy. <laughs> 439. Page 439. And the name of that song is Sweet Hour of Prayer. It's all the verses. Yeah, there's only two, I think. And the other is. 439. Two. There's only two, yeah. Since will be quick here, we have uh, Majestic Pines at 11, and then Manor House at 1, and uh, Jack, I think he's here today, but I know Jack Talk is going to go speak over at the Manor House for him. And who's doing Big Fork? Mr. Herman today. So hopefully things go well. I know things will go well for all of you. And uh, if you want to join any of those services, or Majestic Pines at 11. I know Kane wants to come hang out at 11, right? So it'd be good to see you. Sure. Uh, Manor House at 1 o'clock, and it's good to see you, Kane, here. So that's it for pretty much announcements. Uh, is there any other announcements? All right, we'll do the last song for the message. Page 108. Rock of Ages.
that second Like Pastor Tom said, page 108, the uh, Rock of Age is in my hand. No price I bring. Obviously, the, the price, the death payments have already been made. That is a beautiful, beautiful verse of the song. Turn over to Acts 17. Obviously, we studied in Galatia there, Acts 13 and 14, where Paul went on his first mission trip up into Galatia. He was stoned, but they were adding uh, ultimately works to salvation. And Paul now is on his uh, second mission trip. And uh, he went by, the first time he went by sea and road, but uh, now he's uh, basically by land here. He comes across Galatia, and he went up into Philippi, which is in present-day Greece. And now he's going to go over to Thessalonica, and then he's going to go down into Athens. That's what today's message is all about. You'll see that. And I love seeing the map because, uh, you know, it's real. It happened. It's where Paul... It's about where Paul spoke, where Paul walked, where people got saved. And I think it's very, very interesting to see, to follow along in the Bible. And actually, you know, it's right here on earth, uh, the things where all of these things that had happened. Today's message is in verse 3, 3b there at the end of the verse there, Paul talks, he says, and that is Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Let's open with the word of God. Let's open with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just uh, so thankful for the wonderful words of life that to see a verse like this, that, you know, it is Jesus. He is Jehovah, is salvation. He is Yahweh. And, you know, he is our Redeemer. Yahshua is salvation. And just, uh, and, you know, then Christ which is the anointed one, the Messiah. So this Jesus that Paul preaches is the Messiah. He is salvation. And Father, just the wonderful words here. And just to see a man here preaching Christ, that's what it's all about. And uh, Father, we're so thankful to have a, a building here. We know that the, the church is the body of believers. And Father, we're just so thankful that we have this building, that we can preach Christ, that we can, the people can see what Paul preached, what John preached, what Peter preached, and what you preached. And Ultimately, you preached yourself. You teached 
You know how you would go to the cross and you'd suffer for the sins of mankind and that you would resurrect the third day. So many times that you would tell the apostles this and they not, would not understand until after the resurrection. Then they understood exactly what you were saying. So Father, we just if there's anybody here today that's not trusted in Jesus as their Savior, Father, we just ask that uh, you'd use the Word of God here, use Acts 17 and other other uh, examples in the Bible that uh, they can come and receive Christ. They can believe today because the word of God is so clear. When you preach the gospel, people do get saved. So Father, we just ask that you bless this you know, message today. And, and Father, if it's on TV or YouTube, we just pray that people would receive Christ. So and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now when they had passed through... Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of Jews. And Paul, all his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. You need to know that he just left Acts 16. He just left Philippi up in Macedonia, and he was jailed, he was beaten, he was cuffed. And ultimately, the jailer and, and a lot of people got saved because of his testimony. You know, they, they could see Christ in Paul. So now uh, he moves on to further the gospel. So Paul and Silas now moving through Macedonia. And going west, they come to a town called Thessalonica. It appears Paul stays two full weeks with them, for he stays three Sabbath days. And the question, what was the issue with the Thessalonians? We know on Paul's first mission trip, he went to Galatia, and they were adding the commandments to be followed to the gospel. And Paul called that a perversion, for you cannot add to the finished work of God. If you turn over to Galatians chapter 1, and it's important when we study Acts that you'll possibly read some of these epistles, and you'll ex exactly see what he, some of the issues they were. And they were saying you had to be circumcised, ultimately saying you had to fall back under the law. That's what circumcision meant, because it tells us that over there. In, I think it's uh, Galatians 3. No, it's Galatians 5, 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. So these guys were preaching works for salvation. But I wanted you to read Galatians 1, verse 6 through 9. And if you don't have a Bible, please grab one in front of you because I'd like you to see for yourself. Take the time to find Galatians. It's pretty easy and because you, it's important that you see this. And Paul here, he's speaking to the Galatians. They're saved. But he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And pervert is, perversion is a vile thing. It's very foul. We'll use the word perversion today and ultimately it means vile, disgusting. So when you add to the finished work of Jesus Christ, it is, it is a perversion. Pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. So if you're sitting here today watching this message, listening to this message, and if I would ask you right now, where would you go when you die? Most people say, I hope I'm going to heaven, for I've done a few good things in my life. And I say, let me be real clear, you will not go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven, bad people don't go to hell. If you're trusting in a sacrament like a baptism or communion to save you, you will go to hell. There's only one way to heaven, and that is believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and resurrected for you. You're trusting in the crucified and resurrected Savior to save you. Trusting in what he has done for you. You're saved by faith and faith alone. The Bible is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. My daughter, Miracle, she interviewed me this past weekend from one of her humanities class. She goes to the University of North Dakota. And her objective was to complete an interview with a pastor, a nurse, a lawyer, uh, a log, like a law enforcement, 
Somebody, someone who has encountered death, she had to interview. And she interviewed me, and I, you know, I was honored. One of the questions she had asked is, are you scared of death? I mean, they probably had a list of questions they had to follow. And I said, what a great question. Because you know what? That's a question that we're all going to have to answer. Are you scared of death? Because someday you're going to die. And when we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and resurrected for us, we're trusting in the finished work, we're trusting in him to save us, we become a child of God, and we're forever a child of God. And when you die, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. And I hear Jack say this, the last time you close your eyes here on earth will be the first time you open them in heaven. So no, I'm not scared of dying. Do I want to die? No. But you know, I'm not scared of dying. So once a child, when you die, you'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And I pray through Miracles interview, I hope someone can get saved hearing the interview. So I'm not scared of death, for I know I'm going to heaven, because the Bible tells me, and I can find confidence in the Word of God. Also, you need to know, if you don't trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to know this, the people need to hear this. If you don't believe in the Gospel, you will go to hell. Turn over to, turn over to 2 Thessalonians. Just a couple pages to the right. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. He says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You'll be in everlasting destruction, everlasting fire, away from the presence of the Lord, away from the presence of his power. And there's, no, there's no second chance after you've gone to hell. Either you accept what Christ did for you because you're a sinner, you deserve hell, but you know he paid that death payment for you. And if you've not seen this, I ask that you look up, you let this hand your wallet, let this hand you represent you and I, this wallet here represents our sin, represents our sin. God loves us, hates our sin. But you know what? Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. And this is what he's did for us. He went to the cross and he shed his blood. And then he died and then he rose again the third day showing his payment for sins and paid in full. That's what he's done for you. This is the gift. And when you believe that, you become a son, a child, knowing that you can go to heaven for all eternity, be with, with forever with him. That is the gift we receive in Christ. That's how great our Lord and Savior is. And I hope that you do trust in him right now if you haven't trusted. But the question is, what was the issue that the Thessalonians, we started that off, what was the issue that the Thessalonians, since we're already in Thessalonians, turn over to 1 Thessalonians 1.9. Because every one of these towns he goes through, he deals with a little something a little bit different. And it's the same things we battle with today. I could drive downtown and I can deal with Pentecostalism, I can deal with, with religions, I can deal with idolatry. Right here in Grand Rapids, we have the same problems Paul dealt with at, in his time. Times change, man doesn't. So 30 miles down the road from Philippi to Thessalonica, he's dealing with what? 1-9, for they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's dealing with idolatry over in Thessalonica. And I tell you what, if you believe in any false gods, and we'll say Hinduism, Buddhism, Muslimism, or any other ism in the world, any other false god, because Allah is not the Father. And a lot of religions say, well, Allah is the Father, and He's not. It's demonic. So any other false gods or any other isms in the world are demonic and they will ultimately lead you to hell. 
There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through the Son, but by me. So this is what he's dealing with over in Acts 17. Let's look at verse 3 and 4. He says, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and he risen again from the dead, and thus, and this Jesus, whom I preached unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted, they united with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks in great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Over and over we witnessed Paul what he preached. Paul explaining and demonstrating that Jesus Christ must die. He had to suffer. He must needs have suffered. He must die for the sins of mankind, because without the perfect sacrifice of Christ, we are all held to him sinners. Romans 3, through 25 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins of past through the forbearance of God. Christ, the satisfied sacrifice, he had to come to die. Paul also preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ, showing us the payment for sin is paid in full. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. It is the resurrection chapter. Verse 20 through 23. And Christ is always the example. And he shows us that he resurrected, and one day we will to resurrect also. We'll be absent from the body and present of the Lord, and one day we'll have a resurrected, glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead, is And become the first fruits of them that slept, that died. For since my, by man came death, Adam, because Adam sinned, we were all born sinners. Death was passed on, Romans 5.12. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Christ is the one that gives life. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they are the Christ at his coming. We'll receive our glorified body at the, at the rapture. But the point is Christ is resurrected. That's what Paul preached. That's what we should preach. But yet man, they want to pervert the word of God. They want to add to it. So when you read the Bible, you'll see for yourself, Paul and others preach Jesus, Christ for salvation, and salvation alone. When you preach the gospel, look in verse 3 and 4, what do we see when you preach the gospel of Christ? You need to know people get saved. They get saved. People believe. They're born again. In verse 4, we witness again that people believed and were saved. Jews and Gentiles were saved and not just a few. So you might not see people get saved, but you need to know when you preach the word of God, when you preach the gospel, people get saved. I find assurance, and there's a couple times that you're going to read this in this chapter. How assuring is that? When you preach, people might not tell you, people might not say anything to you, but you know what? You need to know people get saved when you preach it. Look at verse 5. He says, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took of them a certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out of the people. There's always two groups of people in the Bible. They're the ones who believe and they're the ones who don't. We are sinners, but some are believers and some are non-believers. The world wants you to think there's good people and bad people. However, God sees believers and non-believers. There, there are not the ones that are water baptized and there's not the ones that are not water baptized. There's not the ones that speak in tongues and there's not the ones that don't speak in tongues. It's not how the world sees it. Or that's not how the Lord sees it. The Lord sees believers and non-believers. Either you're in Christ or you're not. Read it for yourself. The non-believers move with envy and file and bile. The phrase, lewd fellows of a baser sort. What does that mean? It means they're of the bottom. They're the base, the lowest. 
How does God see non-believers? Non-believers are the lowest sort, for they reject the finished work. These people heard the gospel, and they rejected it. They reject the finished work of Christ, for they are envious and self-righteous, and they think they can earn salvation on their own merit. And these are not my words, but the words of the Lord. These non-believers first got the city in uproar. They went to Jason's house, assaulted his house, which probably means they trashed the place, for they were looking for Paul and Silas, elude fellows of a baser sort. Six, and when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Verse 7, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. The non-believers found not Paul and Silas at Jason's house. The non-believers did not find Paul and Silas, so the angry mob turned their anger towards Jason and other believers. The non-believers said the message that Paul and Silas preached turned the world upside down. That's an interesting phrase, because the gospel of salvation does turn the world upside down. For if you were raised in a religious home, where you were taught good works for salvation, and you were taught good boys go to heaven and bad boys go to hell, and then you hear the gospel, your world gets torn upside down. For everything you were raised, and everything that you were told was a lie. You can't think... You just can't think. I've had people say, well, I can't believe my mom and dad would lie to me my whole life. You can't think that your mom and dad would tell you something that would lead you to hell. But according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to hell if you believe in anything other than Jesus dying on the cross for your sins, burial, and resurrection. And I've shared the gospel, and people do get upset. We had a funeral one time for a little boy. I had somebody in the parking lot going, he was screaming and yelling and swearing out there. And ultimately how he wanted to hurt the people here. People get upset. They want to fight you. The gospel of Jesus Christ will turn the world upside down. Especially the ones that believe in works, good deeds for salvation. They believe in sacraments or believe in any other false gods for salvation. There might be kings on earth with a little K. However, there's only one king with a capital K. Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords. Turn over to John 18, 33-37. So they knew they were trying to get these people riled up. that it looked like they were trying to commit treason. Same thing the Jews did. So they did the same thing to Jesus. Now they're doing the same thing here to Jason and other believers. But I just wanted you to read John 18, 33 through 37, because he is king of kings. And Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of my, thyself, or did others tell you of me? Pilate answered, and he says, I am, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me? What hast thou done? Jesus answered and says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, and then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, and now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou the king of the king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And ultimately, I think there's a reason why we see this in Thessalonians, because he talks about the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ to the Thessalonians, the rapture. And we see that here. So Paul possibly goes back in the third mission trip and ultimately explains some of these things, probably to uh, the people of Thessal Thessalonica. Let's look at verse 8 and 9 of Acts 17. So these Jews that were not believers, they troubled the people. And the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. It appears Jason had to give a deposit. 
was like a security deposit that Paul and Silas had left the city and would not return. We know that ultimately Paul returns in his mission trip three there, but we'll see what exactly happens. But you need to know that just because Paul and Silas left, the, the gospel was still preached in Thessalonica because you had Jason and others there sharing it. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 talks about that. Let's look at verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So Pilate, and over and over we see this, how Paul, and, Paul escapes by night. But then you know what? He goes right to the synagogue in Berea. What does he do? He preaches the gospel. He is a gospel-driven man. Verse 11 through 12. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. Notice the word of God says the men that believed were more noble. Why were they more noble? Because they received the word of the Lord. They believed Non-believers called lewd, fellows of a baser sort. Believers called noble. And ultimately, have you ever heard, have you ever been called a Berean? Maybe you've heard of the word Berean before. And it comes from this. If you've been called a Berean, this would be a good thing. For no man should take what man says or teaches, but search the scriptures yourself to make sure what, what is truthful being said. After you hear the message, you should go home. You should check it out yourself. Read it yourself and search the scriptures. For if you do this, that's what the Bereans do. That would be a good thing. And then in verse 12, when we read, when you preach the gospel, people get saved. 13 through 14. And when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timothy abode there still. So once again, we read the non-believing Jews stirring up the multitude, attack Paul because he preached Christ. We see the same thing happening today. When you preach Christ, you will be attacked by non-believers. Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea, and Paul moved on. Verse 15, And that they, and they that conducted Paul, brought him into Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy, for to come unto him with all speed, and they departed. Paul was now in Athens, and he sent forth a message to Timothy and Silas, and he says, Come down to Athens with me. Verse 16, And Athens is down here. On the Aegean Sea. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Athens, the intellectual city of the world. It is where Socrates, Plato, Aristotle had studied the colleges. This is where this philosophy is based upon today. It is where they taught human intellectualism. And ultimately, Paul is in this intellectual city today, at this time. He is stirred. His, his, obviously, his spirit is stressed because it's filled with idolatry. And I say anything but the blood of Christ is idolatry. 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he's in the synagogue and he's out there ultimately with the Jew and, the, and ultimately the Gentile. He took the time to share the gospel in the marketplace. Whomever he could meet, he could share. If you would have a discussion with him, he'd share. He had a heart for winning souls. 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him and some said what will this babbler say maybe you've been called the bible thumper yourself or babbler but ultimately that's all right other some he seemed to be a setter forth from strange gods because he preached unto them jesus and the resurrection so we're introduced to two groups here epicureans and stoics 
Epicureans are the ones who taught self-indulgence. Self -indulgence. They would probably be the uh, atheists of today that said, basically, if it feels good, do it. They believe there's no God. And they would say, they would taught, they would say, drink today for tomorrow you might die. And we see people obviously live like that. And if you know what, if I can get ahead, if I can step on you, I'm going to step on you to take advantage just so I can get ahead. We see the same two groups today. The Stoics are the ones who self-taught, who taught self-discipline. They would teach that one is to abstain from self-indulgence. They believe everything is God, and that is pantheism. Pantheism is there's no God, there's no Son, and there's no Holy Spirit. Pantheism, pantheon, pantheism is ultimately where God is the universe. God's in this flower. God's in the, in the trees. God's in the cows. And Sinus has a similar thinking of like Mother Earth. When you preach Jesus Christ, especially to those who have never heard Jesus Christ, it sounds strange, but people still need to hear the gospel because obviously it sounded babbling. One thing I would like you to notice, Paul is very consistent in what he preaches, very consistent. He didn't show up one Sunday and hear him preach Jesus Christ, the blood, and then another Sunday talk about, you know, you got to give your life to Jesus. He's very consistent in his message. And ultimately, if people want to preach or teach, ultimately, hopefully, they can learn, this is who I follow, you need to be consistent in the message. He preaches, us all ultimately, that Christ died for sins and, and the resurrection of Christ. 19 through 21. And they took him and brought him into Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine, whereof thou speakest this? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we would know thereof what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were spent their time in nothing else but neither to tell or to hear some new thing. The men of Athens were interested in hearing. They discussed the life, the meaning of life, philosophy. And, but they wanted to hear what Paul had to say. They wanted to hear more and they took the time to sit down and listen to him. And Paul took the opportunity to share the gospel with him. Look at 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, another great sermon of Paul's. And he says, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And what does the word superstitious mean? If you don't know, I'd ask that you'd get yourself a concordance because you know what? It means religious. Paul stood up and he acknowledged the men and said that they were religious. As a matter of fact, they were very religious. 23, he says, For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I find an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignore, ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The Athenians were so religious that they didn't want to miss any gods. And I say little g, little gods. They worshipped for they built an altar to all the gods. And they ultimately built an, uh, an altar to an unknown god. And this unknown god is the god Paul wanted to share with them. 24. God that made the world. And the same. He does this back in when he goes to Galatia. He lays the foundation that God is the God of creation here. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So God made all creation and is supreme above all. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. And this God does not need man-made temples to live in. Remember, we are in this intellectual city philosophical city, and they were asking questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is my existence? What is the means of my existence? Does life really matter? And you know all those answers that the ivory towers out there today, the, these campuses around the United States, around the world, All of our answers to life are in this Bible. Everything. Now, I'm college educated. I encourage 
I want my kids to go to school. I'm not saying anything bad there, but we need to be cautious what you ultimately what you what you teach and hear because you're going to hear a lot of false things. And I'm telling you, all the answers to life are in the Bible. Jesus Christ answers all the questions man could ever ask. Let's look at 25. Neither is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. God is not sustained by human provisions. Matter of fact, God is the provider of all things. And we read this a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to read it again. And then we'll, because if you weren't here, but you need to know this. Do you know Jesus Christ created all things? So many people think the Father created all things. It was Christ. In John 1, 1, 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. God created the heavens and earth. Jesus Christ, He spoke stars into existence. He made this earth. He breathed life into Adam. That was Christ. Christ creates the first creation. He also creates the second creation. To be born again comes from Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 19. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. And I think that's amazing. Christ created the heavens and earth. He spoke stars. He gives us the first creation. And he also gives us the new creation to be born again. Christ did everything. And he's... Ultimately, I think these people here in Athens are getting it. Verse 26. And hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. See, we have groups, cultures that think they're high society, they're better than, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Caucasians thinking they're better than African Americans. We're not, we can't be of the same bloodline. We're the pure race. And he's humbling these Athenians because they thought they were something better. The Grecians, they thought they were high society, better than, you know, the Gentiles over down in Israel there. He says, And hath made one blood all nations of man for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and bounds of their habitation. The questions philosophy can never answer. The Bible has always the answers. And, my, and there, the question is, where do I come from? You come from what bloodline? You are descended of Adam and Eve. We're all born of Adam. And ultimately, here in 26, God is all-knowing. He is all-powerful, and he knows all things. And he knew exactly when nations would come to rise, and he would know when all nations would come to fall. 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. See, God is not too far removed. For he is seen in creation every single day you wake up. God speaks to us through his creation. And every evening we get to witness his knowledge. Psalms 19, 1 through 3 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Every day he speaks to us through his creation. And every night we get to witness his knowledge. 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. All these other gods were false idols. For behind every false idol is a demon. And behind every false idol is a demon. Paul is telling the Athenians on Mars Hill that this unknown God is the creator of them. For God is the one who gave man life. And there is no other God or demon that can claim to have created. You have to remember we are all his creation, but we are not his children. For we must be born again. John 3.3 3. John 3, 7, Jesus says to Nicodemus, who was a religious man himself, and he was not saved because he came to Jesus by night. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 7 says, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. 
Verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God is his like unto gold, silver, stone, graven art, and man's devices. If you've had a philosophy class, I don't know if I probably say it wrong, but it goes things like um, one plus one equals two, and then it goes like, 2 minus 1 equals 1, therefore 1 plus 1 is 2 or something like that. They have this, they have this logical model that they use, and uh, I don't really quite recall it from school, but I remember this logical model, and they always end with, therefore, this is, so, this is the way it has to be then. And here, and it's kind of what I get out of what Paul is talking here, ultimately 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, he says he uses a logic model, a philosophical model, and it basically says to the intellectual city of the world, and he says, God created man. Man is after God's image. Therefore, God is not a graven image created by man. And you can see the Athenians, they, they're getting it. They're sitting around, they're starting, they're starting to understand. Just because we create this stone that looks like half, half bull, half man, or things like that, doesn't mean he's a god. Ultimately, we know all idols ultimately have the demons behind them. Verse 30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. See, God was patient with sin. For example, idolatry. He was patient with all this idolatry happening within the Athenian city. But now Christ has preached. And it is time to believe. Repent means to change your mind. Forget trusting. If you look at it just in this context, it doesn't mean feel sorry here. It doesn't mean feel bad. It doesn't mean i got to cry. It means change your mind because these false idols that you're trusting in, they're not saving you. Forget trusting in the idols to save you. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day. He has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ has already paid for the sins, past, present, and future. However, if you reject Christ as your Savior, you will stand before Christ one day and be judged. That is the white throne judgment. However, you can know you have been ordained to eternal life once you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and resurrected for you because he hath appointed a day. Just because you say there's no God or there's multiple gods, you know what? One day you will stand. If you reject him, you will stand in one, and you will, you will know that he's real. Not stand in some false idol. You will stand in front of the presence of Jesus Christ the one who created all things, the one who died for you and he offered you eternal life. And ultimately he says, you know what, I'll respect your decision. I'll respect your choice. You chose to reject me. But you know what, I'm a just God and I'm going to allow you to go to hell and you're going to have to pay for your sin for all eternity. He will respect that choice because he has appointed the day. It is going to happen. I hope to God you or your family members are not appointed to that day. 32 to 34. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And don't you get that? They mock you. Some mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto them, and believed a third time, among which was Dionysius, Aeropagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. To the Athenians, some did not like to hear that they would be resurrected unto eternal life. They didn't want to hear it. However, what they didn't understand already is that they were dead already. They were dead in their sins. They were dead men walking, and they needed to be born again. And ultimately, for the third time we hear in Acts 17, when you preach the gospel, people believed. There were some that believed, and there were others that didn't. Believers non-believers which group are, which group are you in 
Any questions or comments on Acts 17? Let's close in a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just, we just absolutely love the Word of God. We can come here and read it ourselves. We can see it for ourselves. You know, not get caught up, you know, in political correctness, but biblically correctness. That we can look at man through God's eyes, through the lenses of God. And ultimately, we see that there's two groups. There's believers and non-believers. Believers Believers go to heaven, non-believers go to hell. And that you provided this gift, the gift of eternal life to everybody. You provided, you, uh, you, your son became propitiation, a satisfied sacrifice. For only God, only God could die a perfect sacrifice. Only God could pay for the sins of mankind, of all mankind, not just one or two men, but every man that's ever lived. And only God could die for sins that had not happened yet, past, present, and future. And only God could be buried and then resurrect the third day, showing us the payment for sins we paid in full. And Father, if there's anybody here today or later on that listening to the message that they're like, you know what, that makes sense. Maybe they were trusting in idolatry, thinking that you know, praying to a statue would save them. They can sit here today and pray and pray to the, to the living God, the God that sits at, on the right hand of the Father, the one who's done everything. And he says to the Father, the person says to the Father, says, you know what, I believe that. I believe that Christ died for me and he resurrected for me. That person can be like, thank you, Father, for now they become a son, they become a daughter. They were just born again. Because when you preach the gospel, people get saved. And we know that every message we preach, people get saved. The message goes worldwide. So, Father, we just ask that you continue to bless the message. Continue to keep us safe. For we can continue to share the gospel, Father. And, Father, we're so thankful that we could be allowed to be part of the ministry here. Because it is an honor to be able to, to stand up here, to preach, or to read the word of God, Father. And, Father, we preach to your children to the ones who are trusting in you. They are saved. We just, Father, we just ask that you, know, you continue to speak to them, that they would continue to grow up in Christ, and ultimately, they would live for the things of, of not, that are not external. They would live for the things that are eternal, as Paul tells us in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. You know, and just not get caught up into the worldly ways, but we just take the time to invite people out to church, forward the message to them, or listen to one of Tom's radio ministries, whatever. There's so many. They would go to the one of the nursing home messages where the gospel is getting preached. At the camps, the youth groups. So it is an honor to be part here, to be part of this family, your Father. You brought, you brought together amazing families. And Father, we just ask that you keep us united. Keep us focused on the gospel, keep us focused on the mission here, Father, because our time here is, is short. But you know what? We don't live for the external things. We live for the eternal things. Father, we just ask that you bless the families here today and that you bring us all back, all back next Sunday, where we can continue to give praise and glory and honor to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll all stand and we'll close. Pastor Tom will lead us out. Let's all stand and well, we are standing. I think page 314. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. What a day, what it'll be oh, like. it's what a day. Okay. They're both good. <laughs> <laughs> There's coming a 